let's share with you a bit more about my background. For those who have been with us during previous webinars, okay, this is an overview. And I always like to stress, webinars is not about me, it's actually about you. Okay, and I would like everybody to be participative as much as possible. Okay, if you do have any questions, you can always check with me later on towards the end of this presentation. Okay, expectations. Okay, a few uh, couple of expectations I need to get out of the way. Okay, we'll start at 10. Okay, and now it's 10. I would like all the participants to discuss through the chat session or during the Q&A. Okay, and I will also be using selected case studies, okay, and application. Uh, unfortunately, because of time, I have only one and a half hours, um, and there are quite a fair bit of things for me to do. So I will not go through every single point. I'll just pick up the most important point so that everybody can actually have a gist of it. Okay, so the topic today, okay, how young innovative companies become billionaire, billion dollar unicorns. Okay, unicorn. Okay, if you have been looking at actually a lot of fairy tales and so forth, unicorn is actually a mysterious creature. Okay, um, its existence cannot be verified so far. Okay, it's also actually at the same time Scotland's national mascot. Okay, so as Scotland's national mascot, why did they choose unicorn? Well, I guess because it's legendary. Okay, it's like one of those legendary creatures uh, where it really comes out of actually the storybooks. Okay, but I think we are not talking about those contexts here. We are not talking about Scotland. Neither are we talking about definition of unicorn per se. We are looking at a venture capitalist. Okay, how they actually come up with this terminology and this password called unicorns. Okay, so very importantly, I need to first define in the eyes of venture capitalists what is the password unicorn about. Okay, these are actually some companies that a lot of you are very familiar with. Okay. Airbnb, Grab, TikTok, okay, SpaceX. Okay. One common feature about all of them, they are all billion dollar worth. Okay. And yet, if you look at actually their existence, they have not been around for a long time, unlike the Fortune 500 companies. These companies itself have grown tremendously in the last span of five to 10 years. And today, they are one of the most valuable businesses around the world. Okay. We will look at actually some of the common characteristics about all this, okay, whether is it Airbnb, whether is it Grab, whether is it SpaceX or even TikTok. So your definition of unicorn, okay, this is actually the terminology I borrowed from the venture capitalist world. So unicorn is actually a venture back, okay, private equity company that's valued at a billion dollars worth, okay, or much more. So a lot of people actually probably have come across this definition, but did you know that Unicorn, okay, has different versions. And they are just like your legendary Pokemon as well, okay? Some of you, you have been playing Go Pokemon. You know that actually when you catch one of the, these particular creatures, over time, it will morph into other versions. Same thing applies for Unicorn. There are two other types, okay, of Unicorns. And they are all defined according to their net worth. So here, Unicorn is actually the most space level. It's $1 billion worth. Okay, but when they actually morph, they evolve, it becomes DEFCON, which is $10 billion worth. Okay, and the enhanced version is worth, it will be that HEXOCON, which is actually $100 billion worth. Okay, currently in, in, at this moment, okay, we will see two versions of unicorns, but not the third version. Okay, so which are actually some of these? So you have actually your Total. Okay, Total is a Chinese-based company. Today it's worth 75 billion US dollars. Okay. And who is Total? A lot of people is asking, okay, yes, I do not understand the Chinese words, but Total is the most valuable unicorn among all. Heard of TikTok? TikTok, okay, or Douyin comes from Total. Okay, today they're worth 75 billion dollars. It's the most valuable unicorn in the world. And then you have your TT choosing. TT choosing is just like another version of Grab, except that they come out mainly from China. Okay, as of 4th of April, they are worth $56 billion. Okay, the second most valuable unicorn in the world. You have your Swipe, which deals with actually all these wireless credit card payments. 
Okay, you have SpaceX, okay, by Elon Musk, right? And then you have Airbnb, they're still worth 18 billion despite all the problems that they that you see with them. Okay, and then you have actually a few others that may be quite actually familiar to you. Okay. All right. And of course, lastly, our grab. Okay, our grab comes in at number 10 as of 4th of April. Um, but unfortunately, as we speak today, Grab has lost a fair bit of its market valuation. So today is no longer in the top 10, but one month ago, it was exactly in the top 10, okay, of all unicorns in the world. Okay, uh, some of you may not be very familiar, especially the one that is here, Epic Games. So how did a gaming company become a billion dollar actually unicorn? Heard of Fortnite? Okay, if you guys are like me, you play games, okay, when you go to any apps or any um, websites, you'll see very brief reviews about Fortnite. Fortnite is the game that's coming under Epic Games, okay, and because of this single game, Fortnite, they become $15 worth, right, because the whole world is crazy about them, okay, whole world is playing about them. So one thing that you see, all these 10 companies, okay, are known as, okay, the second version. Right, where they are more than ten billion dollars worth. Okay, there's a lot of others. So in total, right now as we speak, how many unicorns are there? There are four hundred and seventy-one unicorns. Okay, at the moment. So later we're going to deep dive towards the end of my presentation. We'll deep dive to see where are they located. Okay, what the venture capitalists investing in? What are some of these actually key concentrations? Okay, of venture capitalists funding. All right, okay, five years ago, things were not that crazy. We didn't have 471 unicorns, okay? We have much, much lesser. It's less than 100. But five years later, we have 471 unicorns. So if you witness the growth, okay, of all these unicorns, okay, mainly a lot of them are founded in the States, okay? And Asia was very much trying to play follow-up, okay? And then finally, Europe was very, very dormant. Okay, in terms of unicorn foundation. So things have changed over the last five years. Towards the end of today's presentation, I will share with you exactly okay, where are they located and what are they dealing with. Okay, which sector are they in right now? Okay, before that, let's look at the stages of growth in any young companies. Okay, um, some of you may be very familiar because you have worked with small businesses, see them grow and then eventually become large enterprises. Okay, but for the benefit of everyone, I thought it's important for me to share with you the stage, okay? When you first start out, you have a new business, usually an entrepreneur comes about designing your initial business plan. You try to come up with a prototype. You try to actually get some initial sales. So if you look at actually the graph wise, they are at the startup stage where money, okay, is really a scarcity, okay? It's really tough. So many cases, they bootstrap, okay? The bootstrap, they will come up with their own savings. They try to make do with whatever possible. So here they are using frugal innovation, just to entice the initial pool of customers. Okay. Subsequently, as they grow, okay, they start to see some initial success. They start to see actually some sales coming in. They have a bit of more breathing space. They start to hire people. Start to find their own premises. Buy specialized equipment. Okay. So they have actually changed from a very young, very actually uh, fragile startup to one that's seeing early growth, okay? And as time goes, okay, when they are able to build up traction, they start to hire even more aggressively. They build a lot of other prototypes. Competition starts to take notice. And it's during this stage of time, okay, where a lot of you start to place attention on this emerging company. but Venture capitalists do not come in at this stage of early growth. They will prefer to come in much earlier. Later, I'll explain to you why, okay, through a very simple case study, right? So there are three actually stages, okay? So from a young startup, where you see little growth, then you become an early growth, where you see some sales coming in, and finally, you start to pick up momentum, okay? You start to grow exponentially, right? So with all actually uh, stages of startups or business development, okay, there's always an element of risk. Okay, and risk in this case will be assumed by the initial investor. 
So if I were to put time, okay, you see this graph, okay, the risk will always be highest at the seeding stage. And then as the startup starts, okay, gather some momentum, get some initial sales, risk drops drastically, okay, until it goes beyond early growth, reaching expansion and maturity stage. So one thing about risk, okay, you may want to actually have minimum risk, but you want a successful business, that doesn't work. You need to carry out uh, a business with high risk, high growth before you see many returns. Okay, so 80% of startups fail. In fact, in Singapore, it's much higher than that. Okay, in Singapore, it's 90% of startup fail. Um, for the sake of this webinar, we are not going to investigate why, okay? We are just going to come across one statement, 90% of them fail in the first three years. So why did they fail? Okay, and how did the other 5% become high growth? That is the topic of our interest today. All right, okay, here I have, a, I have actually uh, some images, okay, that shows you traditionally how people get their money. Okay, so if you look at the established business here, okay, they get their money either by borrowing from the bank or they will get funds okay, from the government in the form of grants or subsidies okay, uh, or a one-off development actually a payout. And then finally, they can also depend very much on their savings okay, or their retained earnings. This is traditionally the old school. Okay? The old school of thought where businesses are getting their money. Okay? And then comes the other aspect. What if you are not an established business? What if you are a first comer, okay? Or you just barely have an innovative idea, you want to start out. Okay, that is where you actually look at other possible sources. So the orange box, okay, was the old school, okay, of funding. The red box is the emerging school of funding. Okay, so as an entrepreneur, when you have very little resources, you need capital, you need people, how are you get your initial pot of money? You will go to the government, ask for grants as per normal. You will depend on your friends and family members for funding. Okay, you'll start to sell away something of assets or value. Okay, whatever is of value to you, you can go for a mortgage whatsoever to build that initial capital. Okay, two other interesting areas will be venture companies and business angels. Okay something that you don't really hear of so much. Okay, a lot of people actually tell me, you know, you can always go to government and ask for a sum of money. If the government is going to give you a sum of money, I think the government will be bankrupt very soon. As long as everybody has a business idea, you start going to government, I think the government will not be lending you any funds. Okay, so here we are not interested in the old school of funding, but we are interested in the newer school of funding. Okay, and in the newer school of funding, two areas of of key concern, venture capitalists and business angel. This is the hush hush world of venture capitalists that we're going into very shortly, right? So for those people who just joined us, um, I just want to give you an overview that we are going to talk about very much about venture capitalists, okay? And how they help young businesses to grow. Okay, so what is venture capitalists? Okay, what is the definition of venture capital? Venture capital, is a subset of private equity, okay? And it only refers to equity investments made during the very early stages of a business, okay? Venture capitalists do not come in when your businesses are already established. Or for example, if your businesses become a Fortune 500, okay, venture capitalists is not interested because by then you no longer have so much potential, okay, to entice them. So venture capitalists is like any form of private equity except it is highly specialized, highly focused. So the main thing that they do, they provide equity capital to businesses that is not found on the stock market. So if you do see a company that is listed okay, on the stock market, venture capitalists will stay away from it completely. Okay, They are not interested because by then, Okay, the, the initial investors have a cash out. Okay, and we are going to talk about how, how the mechanism works later on. So who are they? What do they do? Okay, why is it that you hear so little about them? Why is it that everybody is excited? Okay, in the, in the business world, why everybody is excited when they hear or when they meet up with them? Because first, they raise pool of money. Okay, 
how they actually get this big chunk of money to finance any young companies. Okay, they themselves have to go and do fundraising. Okay, they have to consolidate money from different people. So it could be institutional level, it could be also individual investors. So institutional level, for example, sovereign funds, governments. Okay, um, it could also be retirement funds, like for example, our CPF. Individual investors will be people who are billionaires themselves. So they, their first rule, okay, their first function is to raise funds for themselves. Okay. Second, they will finance new and rapidly growing companies. The key word here is new, okay, and rapidly. Okay. So what is rapid? How is how is it considered rapid? Rapid when you become a billion dollar company within the next five years. Okay. That is rapid. And then they will purchase, okay, equities, okay, and take bought positions. This is basically what they will demand for and what they are looking at. How do we entice them to come into a company to invest? Okay, they will add more value, okay, to the business through active participation. That's the reason why they take bought positions. They do not want to be the chairman. They do not want to be the CEO, but they want to be on the board. Okay, and they will also want to take up higher risk because higher risk means higher returns okay so a lot of venture capitalists itself goes into industries and companies where okay some of us will be scratching our head why did the venture capitalists do that okay why why do they invest in all those loss making companies because high risk gives high returns okay and they adopt a long term vision okay they are not interested like speculators i go in I get my money, I make a bit of money, I get out of the market. It doesn't work for venture capitalists. Venture capitalists adopt at least a three to five years horizon. Okay, They want to see the company reach a certain milestone before they are ready to exit. Okay, So these are just some of the key things that venture capitalists do. Right? And later, we're going to look at how venture capitalists exit okay, from the whole market as well. Okay, Other ways of funding innovation, Okay, today, Besides going to venture capitalists, you can go for your accelerators. You can go for crowdfunding, okay, which is another emerging, emerging field of open innovation. And then you have corporate bonds. You can just be like SIA, issue corporate bonds, and then get investors to pump in okay, new funds. Right? But corporate fund bonds have been around for a long time. That's very, very old school. Okay? Even way before I was born, it's been there. Okay? Crowdfunding is new. Accelerators has been there as well. So crowdfunding is actually the new way. So what if you're not going to use any of this? That's when venture capitalists will come into the picture. Okay, so why do we actually look at finance okay, of innovation? Because first, when you have high growth innovation, um, especially in these firms, they will require a lot of capital to scale up. Okay, and this scaling up is making it really challenging for them to go to conventional sources for funds. Okay, you go to the bank, the bank will only lend you at most one million. That's all. Full stop. Okay, nothing more. And you have to provide assets, okay, collaterals as guarantee. All these innovative firms, remember, they have been around for less than five years. Okay, some of them not even five years, maybe three years. How are they going to provide okay collaterals to bank to secure a loan when they are not even profitable in the first place? Okay, so one, one, one of the actual challenge for them is they need to lay their hands on a huge amount of money within a short window of time. Second, okay, all these companies have intangible assets. They have know-how, they have patents, they have intellectual properties. But it's very difficult for you to put a dollar and cent okay, to all these invisible assets. Banks will not understand that very well and banks do not know how to evaluate them as well. So because of that, okay, many a times they struggle. They struggle to earn the first dollar of profit before they generate even more. Okay, so there is always a significant delay between them generating revenue and them collecting the first dollar of profit. Okay, and finally, because a lot of them will fail along the way. Okay, a lot of these young businesses will fail. Only three percent of all businesses worldwide receive some form of venture capital. Okay, and that brings us to a bit more. So why do we need to care about them? Why do we need to know about them? Because they are responsible for a good number of patents and new technologies. A lot of technologies that you see in your app, okay, in your apps, in your phones, 
uh, on the web. All these are coming out from venture capitalists. I'm going to give you a, a list of some companies that you probably heard of, you have seen it, and you have used their products as well. Okay. Second, without actually the finance for innovation, we won't have disruptive innovation. Okay, disruptive innovation itself changes the whole gameplay of businesses. And without venture capitalists funding all these young businesses, we will see less and less radical innovation. And that will allow us to enjoy less products. Okay, that helps us in our pursuit for better life. So with venture capital, they bring radical innovation to the whole marketplace. Okay, and they help all these young, okay, uh, non-profitable business, but with high growth to grow much faster. Okay, all right. So there are five actually main types of VC funds. Okay, um, some of it you heard of it before, like private equity funds. Okay, this is very very common. Okay, they are always taking money from former business and entities. Okay, etc. Okay, the biggest example I can share with you for a private fund. Okay, will be people like for example Facebook. Okay, Facebook co-founder. Okay, he comes out, he starts his own called sequential, uh, sequential um, actually capital. So that's concept private. Okay, corporate. Okay, corporate VC funds are subsidiaries of large firms. In Singapore, you will see a few like Inno8, okay, which is part of Singtel. All right, and then you have actually Singbridge, which is part of the Masik Holdings. All these are corporates. They are subsidiaries of large multinational corporations or large national businesses. Okay, public. This is actually when the government takes a direct view. Okay, um, heard of SoftBank? Okay, SoftBank okay, itself uses a lot of money from the Saudi Arabian government. Okay, and they created what they call a 100 billion vision fund. Okay, this $100, uh, 100 um, billion dollar vision fund is very much funded by the Saudi Arabian okay, sovereign fund. And hybrid where there's a collaboration in government and as well as private funds collaborate, they try to do something, okay? And lastly, angel groups, okay? Also known as angel investors. Okay, for the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to focus on three main groups, okay? Which is your A, your private VCs, B, your corporate VCs, and lastly, E, your angel investors. So why am I not so concerned about C and D? Because they are very rare, okay? Almost unheard of. Right? And the bulk of all VC venture capitalists all comes from A, B, and E. Okay. Okay, so focusing on private VCs. Okay, who are they? It's actually the most common type of VC because they always started as an investment firm. Okay, using money okay, raised from institutions and individuals. They always organize themselves as a holding company, like for example, SoftBank is a holding company. Okay, and their main interest is that when they get all this money from the institutions and individuals, they will have to pay back all these institutions and individuals interest for the money that they raise. Okay, so in other words, uh, someone like maybe CPA bought, okay, because it's part of a sovereign fund, they may decide to invest in SoftBank. So SoftBank collect this pool of money. Okay, it doesn't mean there's no interest. SoftBank will still have to pay back, okay, to CPF or any other sovereign fund interest for part parting with their funds. Okay. And the biggest compensation that they can ever receive, okay, is an IPO. When one of these actually private enti uh, entity that they hold goes into public listed, okay, so that's when they get a lot of cash out, okay, uh, remuneration. Okay, fund size is about 25 billion, okay, up to tens of billions, okay, so that's a size. If you go to a venture capitalist and you say that I want to borrow actually 10,000, okay, the venture capitalist will straight away okay, walk away because the money is too little. They are not interested. They can't see how you are going to scale up, okay? And their motivation is probably money, dollars and cents. Their interest is to maximize ROI on whatever they hold, okay? And the ultimate aim is your IPOs, your mergers, or your acquisitions. Someone buys over, someone gets published, but someone merges with another big company. That is the biggest cash cow that is coming into a private VC, okay? And then we'll move into corporate VCs. Corporate VCs are relatively less heard of, but they're still around, okay? You have Intel, you have Cisco, you have Siemens, AT&T, okay? 
Okay, so they are usually part of a bigger company. Okay, they use a lot of corporate funds from the parent to go about investing in smaller companies. Okay, um, two days ago, all right, um, one of actually the leading banks, okay, decided to go into VC. Okay, and this is actually sensational news because many a times banks are competing with some of these young innovative companies, but today they are helping all these young innovative companies to grow exponentially through corporate VCs. Right? So the main key thing they are interested in, they are not interested in the return of investment. Okay? They may not be concerned. They want to actually spur the revenue growth of the VC corporation. Okay? And they will provide okay, some valuable connections. But one thing that differentiates them from private VCs, they would like to take a vaccine. They are not interested in getting too involved in your day-to-day -day running. They are not interested in necessarily getting a, a boardroom okay, seat reserved for themselves. They just want to pass you the money and then they want to wash their hands off. Okay, hopefully you grow. All right, thanks very much. And remember to pass me my returns. That is the, the, actually the key difference between a private VC and a corporate VC. All right. Okay. And... How would they fund these young companies? First, they use venture capital. They put money in. They get involved with all these companies if necessary. They will also look at funding in different stages. Okay, pre-seed, seed, early stage. Okay, also known as series A, and then late stage and expansion. Okay, so it's B, C, D, E, F, G, so and so forth. Okay, when young innovative companies become billion dollar unicorns, they don't stray away from from pre-seed emerge into series A and then emerge into series F. They don't. Like any actually uh, kids, okay, they will grow as time matures. Okay, so they'll start with pre-seed. So what is pre-seed? Pre-seed is when the venture cap, uh, capital doesn't get involved yet. This is when the entrepreneur first bootstrap, okay, come up with the initial pool of, fund, of funds to jumpstart the business. So pre-seed is exactly what a lot of young entrepreneurs are doing today. Okay, they come up with some of their savings. Okay, they start a business. So that's pre-seed. Okay, venture capitalists will only be interested in the seeding stage or the early stage or even the late stage. But they are not interested in the pre-seed stage because they want you to prove a minimum viable proposition, also known as MVP. You need an MVP before venture capitalists will be enticed. Right? So stages of VC funding, okay? So you have the seeding stage, okay? What I mentioned earlier. And then at one stage of time, you may invite the angel investors, also known as business angels, to come in to take a look. Later, I'm going to help you differentiate what is business angel, okay? All right? And then subsequently, as the company grows, okay, you have early stage funding, series A, B, C, mezzanine. Okay, when this diagram was created, Okay, I, I think it's actually a bit uh, old school yet because back then there was only series C. Okay, today, okay, those billion dollar unicorns have evolved into series E. Okay, so E is actually even higher. All right, it's probably somewhere here. So that's why they can evolve very quickly over time. All right, and let's actually look a bit more about how VCs get their money. Okay, because VCs don't have billion dollars paycheck. Okay, they must get the money from somewhere. So this diagram, okay, let's focus on this orange box first. So we call them limited partners. Limited partners are the people who have a lot of these spare funds, okay, looking for high returns on investment. And because these are stagnant funds, these funds are not actively out in the market. VCs, okay, that's in the middle, will go about courting these limited partners that includes insurance companies, family offices, high net worth, endowments, and of course, government, okay, and as well as pension funds. Pension funds in Singapore will be CPF, okay? So these VCs will go to all these institutional partners and individuals and say, okay, since you have so much money, okay, and your returns are probably not as high as what you should be, why don't you pass the spare cash to me? I promise within 10 years, I will give you a particular high interest, okay, guaranteed. Okay, so I enter into agreement with you. And then these limited partners will leave money with the VC for a period of 10 years. Okay, and will the, will the VC do nothing? They will obviously take this money, okay, and invest in other companies, okay, especially young innovative companies for three to five years. Okay, the younger, the more high growth, the 
the better it is. Okay, they'll put money into all these companies for three to five years, and then get these three to five years for these companies to grow to a, to a formidable size before they will convince these companies to go for IPO, go for mergers, or go for acquisition. And then they will cash out. Okay, this is when VCs try to exit from these companies. Okay, cash out. They will collect whatever they, they need. Okay, so going back to the VC fund. And then remember the VC was there to pay back okay, to all these limited partners. So that's when they return the interest plus the principal amount back to these limited partners. So actually in this case, VCs looks very much like the middleman. Well, you're not wrong. They are the middlemen, but they are very, very capable and very, very savvy middlemen. Okay, it is something that most middlemen will not be able to do. Right? They are actually the deal makers. Okay, between the venture capitalist world as well as actually all these young innovative companies. Right? So, how does VC portfolio look like? Okay, here I, without naming any companies, okay, I chosen ten fictitious companies to show you how VC works. So, say this VC has like a uh, software has hundred billion dollars. Okay, Vision Fund. They decided to invest in ten companies. Okay, company one to company ten. That you see here. So some of these companies may succeed, some companies may be dead, some of these companies will be dormant. It doesn't matter. What they are hoping for is that if three companies are dead, it's fine. I'll write them all. Three companies are not doing so well, so they are like a zombie, the walking dead, right? So they are doing fairly okay, but not exponentially well. It's fine. So I will make loss on six, okay? Six companies. But I'm playing my bets on the last four, okay? Because in company seven, if it gives me one time return, well, it covers one of the loss for one of the company. And then company eight, company nine gives me more returns. So seven, eight, nine can already cover for the loss of one to six, okay? Company 10, which is exceptional, okay? This will be people like Web. This will be people like uh, TT Choosing. When they are exceptional, they give you returns more than 15 times, okay? And that is what VCs are betting on, okay? You also have SoftBank. $100 billion worth, okay? They invest in 48 companies. So you'll be asking, why can't they invest in one? Why can't they invest in 10? Why do they want to go for 48? Because they know very well, when they spread the eggs, okay, the chances of them hitting a company 10 will be higher than if they are investing in only one company. So it is actually where they spread their risk, but yet in the search for high returns, they decided to diversify, okay, all their resources. So VCs are always hoping for a unique company to give them 15, 20, 30 times return because that will make their efforts worthwhile. So pros and cons, okay? When you go to VC, okay, good and bad. Okay, first they give you finances, okay, which you can't get anyway through the bank. Bank needs you to prove uh, an asset, needs you to show that you have been profitable for three years, okay? And VCs will give you connection to industry experts because they themselves are extremely well connected. They are extremely resourceful. They can use their connections to connect you with the host who, okay, to grow your business. So this is a second most valuable contribution besides money. Third, they will help you to correct okay, your business model. It will help you to identify, help you to uh, look at new ways okay, of growing your business further. This is something that banks will not help. Banks only take a passive stand, right? And the cons, okay, you need to give up your equity, okay? You have to surrender ownership and control of this company to the VCs, okay? They will also get outsiders to get involved, okay? They will get some of these actually people, okay, to be independent board of directors, to sit on your board, okay, to keep a check on your day-to-day, -day, right? So you have to give away some of your um, private seat, okay? And then finally, when you raise capital, you need time, you need effort. VCs are difficult to call, honestly. You can spend one year, two years, and you still end up with nothing. So it takes too much time and effort. So there's pros and cons when you're calling a VC, all right? Okay. So comparison between banks, okay, and VCs, uh, because in terms of time, I'll not go through everything, okay? I'll, I'll go through this actually in my um, training classes. Okay, the third type, business angel. Okay, a lot of people get confused between business angels and VCs. Business angels are individuals. They are rich individuals, okay? Rich individuals in the sense that they maybe have 10 billion, okay, $10 million worth of assets. 
but they are not as rich as VCs because VCs have billions okay, of dollars to spend. But business angels, they are rich, but they are not that rich. So they have a lot of spare cash, liquidity. Okay, they don't mind to part some of this money because otherwise all this money is sitting in the bank anyway, okay, or sitting with a stock which is not growing. So they may be comfortable to pass you some initial sum of money. And business angels, BA, okay, they are usually from the same industry okay, that the business is from. So for example, if you call a business angel, uh, someone who's from technology, your company must be a technology company in the first place before you go and talk to BA. Okay, you can't be like say in FMB and then you go and talk to a BA. It doesn't gel, right? So business angels will not be comfortable with that because they do not know your industry. So one prerequisite, they will need to know very much about industry before they think about putting money in. And they will invest at a very early stage. Usually when the when the initial entrepreneur doesn't have too much funds to grow further, okay, they hit a stagnation, okay, in their growth. So that's when business angels will come in, give you a bit of support. Okay, and same thing like VCs will bring you to a lot of valuable contacts within the industry. Okay, some of these actually companies that you see here are backed by VCs and backed by BAs, okay, business angels. Okay, any company that you've not seen on, seen before in this page, uh, I think it's quite hard to find a company that you have not seen before on this stage. Okay, and one common characteristic, no matter whether they are in actually grocery delivery, whether they're in technology, whether they are in transportation, whether they are in gaming, or have used money from VCs and business angels to grow. Okay. Okay. So let's look at sources of funds. Okay. I'm going to introduce you to Sally. Okay. Sally is actually the founder of a very young company who has a very interesting value proposition. So Sally being a founder is at the initial seeding stage. Okay. And trying to start up with her own first uh, company. So they assume the highest risk, okay? Sally will put up 100K of her savings or get their, their own actually salaries, okay, to finance this initial company, right? So they may work without salary, okay? But it doesn't mean that it's forever. They may work without salary for a while until the businesses become profitable. Then that's when they will start to draw initial pool of money, okay, as allowance, right? And they would have to provide space, usually a garage or a basement. They use maybe an office like me, I use my study room. Okay, yeah, that's actually how they get started, okay, with their own small little company. All right, and they will ask for favors. They ask all their friends, okay, ask their associates, oh, can you do me this free of charge whatsoever? Okay, so they have to depend a lot on their independent uh, actually networks, okay, or connections to get things done. So Sally finds that, oh, yeah, not too bad. Huh? I got something off the ground. Okay, now I exhausted my funds. I use up all my 100K. Um, so the next natural source, obviously, is friends, okay, and family. So you turn to your friends and family. You say, okay, yeah, I have this company that's doing pretty okay. I'm hoping to go to the next phase, okay, to go into an early growth stage. Um, can I actually borrow funds from you? Can I get some actually help from you in terms of lending? So it's still high risk, okay? All these actually friends and family will part, okay, up to 200K of their money. It's quick money, why? Because they know you. They know the entrepreneur. They don't ask too much questions, okay? They'll pass money to you and there's a relationship risk when you fail, okay? It may destroy whatever relationship you have with that person, okay? And it, there's also actually some form of initial agreement, right? And it's very passive. Your friends and your families do not know what you do. But because they trust you, they think that you're doing fairly okay. So they part 200K with you, okay? And to help you in, see some initial growth. Okay, um, I saw, I'm sorry to use this terminology, but in the VC world, okay, they call this stupid money, okay? We call it silly money as well, okay? So why are they called silly? Because they don't do any due diligence on you, okay? They just simply pass their money to you and hope that you continue to grow. And what if you're making a loss? They don't know as well. So VCs call them silly money, okay? And then here comes a business angels, what we call smart money, okay? These people are actually someone like Tom, okay? Sally, after depending on their family and friends, okay? Now starts to see some initial success, goes into early growth stage, okay? She decides to court, okay, the friendship of 
Tom, who's a very rich individual, who decides to put some money, okay, let me help you more. And Tom happens to be the same industry as Sally, okay, previously, he was a retiree, but he has lots of this spare cash, okay, and he always have a vested interest to help people like Sally to grow. So Tom, as a business angel, decide to invest 50K to 1 million in Sally's business, okay, in return for some equity, okay. So this is when they will take one third, okay, of all the deals at the seeding stage, okay. And Tom, because he put his money, right, okay, onto the table, he wants to be part of Sally's company by taking a box seat, okay. And success day comes, okay. Initially, he, he actually was pretty okay. It was still a small business. And then the venture capitalist comes in, okay. So in this case, it's a group, people like SoftBank. So SoftBank takes notice and SoftBank says, okay, Tom and Sally, you've been doing pretty okay. You have a very interesting value proposition. Now, I want to help you to grow the next mile. And here, I'm going to put in 1 million to 5 million, okay, in the initial stage. But this is just seeding stage, okay? I'm giving you the money to prove to me that you can do it, right? Before I promise you more and more money, okay, in the next round or the subsequent rounds. Okay, here, we're not into series A yet. We're just talking about seeding, okay? And it will take 6% of deals, okay, at seeding or startup stage. So generally, VCs will lead one round. They will raise funds for you, for Tom and Sally. They will go to their all their connections and ask for some initial funds. They will lead one round, and in return for that, they will take a seat plus a heavy um, actually equity share, okay, of your business. And finally, when VCs actually invest, okay, they have seen you grow exponentially. As your businesses expand, becomes very mature, everybody knows about you, okay, comes a sad story, okay, acquisition. Banks, okay, you may start to borrow from banks or VCs may force you to go into acquisition or equity or IPOs, okay, but IPOs are very, very rare. Acquisitions are much more common. For example, someone like Sintel can agree to buy over an technology company, that's VC back. Good enough. I don't need to be IPO. I can exit immediately. Okay. All right. So IPOs. What are IPOs? Some of you have been buying shares, heard about stock markets. You should not be too willing to this. This is when one of the private companies decides to achieve equity by selling its stock okay, to the public on through the stock exchange. So founders, people like Tom, Sally, okay, venture capitalists will sell off their stock, okay? Literally, most of their stock. And then they may decide to go back to square one with another startup, especially VCs. VCs will not stop at investing in a company. They sell off one company, they'll go into the next, okay? So another form of alternative investment market, okay, this is actually found in London Stock Exchange, okay? Um, AIM is launched on 19 of June, okay, 1995. So through this actually secondary stock market, it has raised $24 billion worth, okay, and it has helped 3,000 SMEs to raise equity, okay, raise funds. And all businesses are welcome, whether you're early stage, you're VC back, or you're more established, you're more than welcome, okay, to seek funding through AIM. So besides IPO, okay, AIM is another alternative, okay where VCs can let go of these private equities. So where do VCs invest? Okay, this is the, the crux of the investment terminologies that are adopted by VCs. Okay, if you look at actually 471 unicorns around the world, okay, they are hosted by, in how many countries? They are hosted by 26 countries. Okay, so here I'm giving you actually some ideas of which countries. Okay, you guys have the, almost a lion's share belongs to United States. And then China takes on the other sizable chunk, about 30% of it is China, okay? And followed by the rest of the world. Singapore, unfortunately, uh, I have to put it under the rest of the world because to date, there are only two unicorns, okay, in the country. And one of it, you probably see every other day, okay, is Grab, okay? Grab is one of the two unicorns that is using Singapore as a headquarters, right? Okay, so... Host countries, okay, these are the top five host nations, okay, they host a lot of these unicorns. So China is coming up very quickly. In comparison to the first initial slides where I show you five years ago and five years later, 
US had unicorns have grown tremendously throughout the five years. And you notice that China is catching up very quickly versus US. Okay, now it's almost actually conquering 30% of all the VCs, okay, making China as a home. Okay, United States is still leading, but it's losing its leadership, okay, dominance very quickly. Right? Okay, so where do they invest? They invest in all these industries. Okay, so they will actually have five most popular hot favorites: fintech, okay, internet services, e-commerce, AI, and transportation. So the number that you see on the side, okay, this number that you see is the number of unicorns that are in this industry. So 61 unicorns are in the area of fintech, okay. 57 are in internet services like Zoom, right? Okay, for example, Zoom is one of them. Okay, e-commerce will be people like Alibaba, okay, or people like um, actually Zalora, okay. They are all in e-commerce, so 55 of them. And then followed by AI, transportation, and so on and so forth, right? So these are all the major industries that fintechs are found, okay? And these are all the major industries where unicorns are manifesting themselves, okay? Let's zoom in into location, okay? So you notice the green color is America, Okay, the highest bar is internet software and services. Somehow American back, okay, unicorns have a soft spot for fintech, okay, and internet software. Whereas for the Asian counterparts, they are very, very interested in e-commerce. Okay, this is mainly because of the booming demand, okay, for online shopping. And um, e-commerce itself is actually propelled further by the rising media class okay of asia so us and asian vcs always look at e-commerce okay and europe some or rather things are not happening too actually um regularly but they are very interested in fintech as well and mainly a lot of these actually um companies are founded in uk in london right okay so how does vcs get selected okay how do they select someone to fund okay they look at a few things these are the stages so from opportunity to initial screening to due diligence to negotiation and then before they say okay you have met all my checklists before i give you the money so six out of one thousand business plans get funded vcs every day have nothing but proposals on their table but would they have time to read through all these proposals sorry no they only many probably at most they have 10 minutes to just scan through your proposal and then before they dump it so six out of 1,000 will get funded, right? And then some of them don't even pass the selection stage. So that's why it's very rare that VC comes in to fund a company, okay? Unless you are extremely attractive, right? So what does VC look at? Okay, what goes in behind the scene when someone decides to invest or VC decides to invest, what would they be looking for? They are looking for a big portion of your company funds. They are looking at liquidization liquidation preference that means if i cash out what is my take and then my interest rate okay how much will i be paid okay for lending the money and then they'll also look at possibility of stock options okay these are all the things that vcs will talk to you okay but i'll not zoom into the um actual specifics of each okay case study okay so earlier i mentioned i want to show you how vcs fund and what's in for them okay so i need you to actually stay focused with me um i'll use different boxes okay to highlight where i am all right so let's look at the first initial uh, box when you have a startup okay so here i'm using john earlier i was using sally so john okay started a business equity of his own okay so started something on his own okay so he takes 65 percent share then he get his friends and family members to pump him some other money so he was 65 percent the rest of the family members, etc., holds the other 35%. Okay. And the business has been growing very rapidly. Eventually, they attracted the likes of okay, Avantis Ventures. Okay, Avantis Ventures being a VC decides to invest 300 k okay into the business to help them go towards the next stage. So, in return for investing 300 k Avantis Ventures won 40% okay, of John's startup. Okay, they won 40% shares. So if actually John says, yeah, sure, VC come in, I'll give you 40%. That is when, okay, VC will put 300K and VC will also tell you how much you're worth. Okay, for 40% of your shares, I'm going to pump 
300k. That means your business is now worth 750k. The company's worth is 750k. Okay, so 750k. Then they decided, okay, to reallocate. Now the company is worth 750k. Now they want to reallocate, okay, the shares, the split of shares. Now we are in the green box, okay. So Avantis Ventures will still hold 40 percent. The rest of the other 60 percent, you go and co-divide with the rest. Whoever has a stake in this, okay. So after co-dividing, John's percentage has dropped a lot from the initial 65 to 32.5. That's dilution. They dilute. Okay, so this is when VCs come in. But VCs will not exit yet because John will still have to grow the business. Okay, Avantis Ventures will take an active role in the business. And then eventually, John's company decides to be sold off. Okay, for $2 million. Okay, so this is first scenario. When they decide to sell off, okay, at what price? They decide to sell off, okay, at $2 million. So Avantis Ventures will get 49% of the proceeds from the sale, okay, or from the acquisition. And in return for 49% of the proceeds, Avantis Ventures will hold 980K, okay, with the rest of the amount split according to John and the rest, okay. So this term, as it strategy, is agreed between John and the VC in stage two, okay. And you guys said, even though Avantis Ventures exited, they are making a lot of money, okay? Because initially they invested 300K. Now the business is exiting for 2 million and they're getting 980K. How many times is that? That's three times, okay? Three times the returns, okay? And that's very attractive for a VC, all right? Okay, and subsequently, let's move on to a second scenario. Okay, what if it was a bad exit? Okay, John's company wasn't doing too well. John's company was making a loss. Okay, eventually it has to be sold off to someone else. Okay, it was sold for 500K, right? So uh, despite being sold off for 500K, okay, then Avantis Ventures still wants a lion share, okay? Oh, your business is not doing well, but I am the major, majority shareholder. I want 76% of your proceeds, okay? I walk away with 380K. Right? I invested 300k, I walk away with 380k, I still make money. Not a lot, but I still make money. And that's one requirement. And then poor John and the rest of his friends are left with whatever they invest. They are worse off. Okay, that's scenario two. What if it's a bad exit? What if it's a super exponential growth? Okay, that is when Avantis Ventures sell off John's business for $4 million. Maybe because, oh, there was a very uh, rich institution that wants to buy over John's uh, company. So Avantis Ventures, once again, okay, they want 1.78 million, okay, or 44% of the ventures, leaving the rest for John. They invested 300K, okay, but because John business was doing so well, eventually it got bought over by others, okay. They, Avantis Ventures, because they're the majority shareholder, they will walk away with more than five times the returns. So you have actually seen three scenarios. Okay, bad exit, good exit, not so good exit. Okay, in all cases, venture capitalists will win. Okay, they will not make a loss. Okay, they will definitely actually recoup their investments. Okay, before they walk away from the bargaining table. Right. Okay. So what does VC look look at? What are the VCs interested in? They look at a few things. Okay, these are all the factors. Right, that they examine one by one. The biggest percentage goes to management team. Okay, followed by consumers. There's a typo error here, so it's consumers, and then great products and services. Surprisingly, VCs are not so interested in your products. They are more interested in your founders. Who are they? Do they have the background? Do they have the know-how? Are they entrepreneurial in nature? Okay, do are they more risk taker or are they passive? Okay, so they look at more of the individuals. So what do they really look at? They look at expertise, okay? Do you know what you're doing? Okay, do you have the experience of doing that? Your credentials, okay? Tell me, what have you done in the past, okay? They'll literally do a due diligence on the individuals, okay? Whoever comes into your initial board, okay? They'll scrutinize everybody, okay? They want to know what's your track record, what have you done, okay? Do you have previous fit businesses, so and so forth. And 
they are also looking at the willingness to collaborate. Okay, that is where they can work with you. Okay, some people say manipulate, but I won't use such a strong word manipulate. They collaborate, okay, work with you. And whether you have experience in growing companies. Okay, and finally, if things doesn't work, will you be willing to let me replace okay, the founder? That means I want to replace the co-founder or the founder who started the company. Will you actually be agreeable to that? So these are some of the key things that they look at okay, when VCs examine a young startup company. Okay, second, most important, market potential. How big is the market? If the market itself is very, very small, okay, VCs are not interested. They want scalability. They want to have actually work traction within a very short window. So they'll look at the, the size of the market. They look at your ability to identify the, the hot markets or areas where you can be strong. Okay. And they need you to have very clearly defined buyers. Okay. Who are your customers? Why would they want to patronize you? So they look at your company's market potential and reach. Right? Third most important factor, ah, that's when it comes to product and services, your value proposition. Okay. Surprisingly, it's only rented. Okay, they are going to look at your business models. Does business model make sense? Is it very unique? Okay, is it being copied? Is it actually uh, replaceable? Right. They will also look at whether you are able to solve the current problems of customers. Okay, and finally, your potential IP. Can you protect your own IP? Okay, say I created a platform. Can I protect my own IPs? If I can't even protect my own IPs, well, everybody can replicate, right? Okay, so they will not be interested in that. Okay, so why should you be concerned about VC? Okay, because in many countries, it's a very young industry. Okay, and in many cities, you probably have not heard about them. Right, venture capitalists will also establish with some form of government money. Okay, so if government is investing into VCs, okay, so should pub public. Okay, and then finally, you have equity gap. Okay, there's a big equity gap in the market and then familiarity okay because you have to build up your familiarity with innovation system the okay, innovation is here to stay for sure okay you will not disappear because it has been around for the last 20 years okay you will continue for next 20 to 30 years because with the uh, advancements of technology all right and globalization okay familiarity of vcs okay uh here i have two sectors okay one is public Okay, the other one is private. So public means those as actually government owned. Okay, private means those as actually privately held. Okay, so you realize that actually for public VCs, they are much more knowledgeable. Okay, they are much more connected because they have more resources available. Private VCs, okay, are slightly more niche. They are more focused. Okay, and they will reach out. Okay, they'll put out their, um, actually their reach, okay, extend across all sectors of the economy to look for the next emerging unicorn okay and unicorns itself if they have not hit the 1 billion benchmark you still call them fast growing companies but once they hit the 1 billion dollars okay uh, worth that will be when they transform all right okay with that um i just want to bring some of you to close attention um okay these are some of the programs that i, that I will be actually involved in okay um some of you have been asking okay can i know what's actually your first webinar okay what have you done before can i actually look at um the the first set of webinars i've gone through okay we will be doing a repeat okay of these webinars okay for those who have missed my webinars the first initial one okay we are going to do a rerun okay on the 18th of june thursday so the timing itself and the date is not confirmed yet but we will be looking at that very soon. And then, of course, you have your graduate dips where it talks about innovation, okay, where I will be involved in one of the units, okay, to deliver part of the contents. And then subsequently, you also have your MBAs where that's actually linked to your to, uh, innovation in some ways or another, right? Questions, anyone? Okay, I've come to the end of my presentation. I hope you like it uh, as much as I do, okay? Um, this is something that is not really common. Okay, um, so anyone who have questions for me, um, you can always voice out. Anyone? So, you, you notice actually that for VCs, right, a lot of people will want to invest. Okay, however, VCs will not let go of their shares until they reach certain milestone. 
Okay. Uh, although some of these VC pet unicorns are suffering from a bit of a um, problem right now, especially Airbnb, okay, Grab, okay, but they are here to stay. Why? Because these actual business models of theirs have been tested, has been proven, okay, that it's going to be disruptive. And VCs will hang on, okay, um, because they have the funds, obviously. And they also, because of their long term orientation, they see a purpose. Right? They are not in just because of speculation. They will not cash out until they see actually the promised land. Okay. So for anyone who have questions, um, if, hey Stanley. Yes. Uh, see, uh, we. I'm opening. I have another startup. Okay, and I've been struggling for raising funds. It's one of the first to the Asia market, and it has always been an egg and chicken situation for me. Uh, it's like People say, bring the traction, then uh, make the traction, come to the, raise the money. And uh, to, to, to do the tractions, we need the money. So mm. how do you, uh, what do you suggest? Okay, I think one of the first things is you have to examine your MVP, okay, uh, your value proposition, okay. And, and the other question of interest itself is, um, have you ever tried pitching to a business angel? Maybe VCs are a bit too far, okay. Something that's within reach will be your business angels, okay? Because business angels itself, they themselves are also looking for another exciting business opportunity. Okay, oh, if I may ask, how long has your startup been? Uh, startup uh, pre-pandemic, it startup was going good, and uh, we have the very big brands like uh, Resort World. Mm -hmm. McDonald is su supposed to be onboarded and they are in a process of onboarded. It's just temporary hold because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And uh, we we expecting a huge uh, transactions and tractions uh, from them. We are mm -hmm. on a recruitment platform. So okay. uh, it's, a, it's a first to the market in Asia. So, so when you say recruitment, what type of recruitment may I ask? Is it... Uh, uh, we, we are, we're targeting blue collars. Okay. Okay. It's, uh, the the, so the startup name is, called... Uh, yeah. So yours exactly. is very much uh, more uh, like a placement agency, is that right? We're disrupting agencies. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're a disrupting agency? Yeah. Okay. All right. So one, one of the suggestions that I can give you, okay, obviously is to extend your, your networks further, okay? Um, go into a lot of VC, okay, host or sponsored events, okay, where they will be able to actually work with you, okay? Or at least they need to know about you, okay? So they need to know about you first and then before you strike a conversation. But I would say it is at least baby steps that you're adopting right now. Okay. And to go into that, you will be business angels as more likely okay, to come in. Because there are a lot of other uh, consideration factors that, that you have to look at. For example, scalability okay, of your model. Um, they will also have to look at other things like, for example, your key customers. Okay. Although I have some idea about what businesses you mainly serve, um, but is that like a common feature? Because when you say blue collar, it sounds as if it's a, exactly the same business model that a lot of actually employment agencies or manpower agencies have. So it may not be unique. Okay. Oh, so the uniqueness is something that you probably will need to, to share a bit more. Sure. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, we definitely has the unique in it because yeah. we do not, uh, it is where everything is online platform mm -hmm. and uh, it's mobile app based. It does not have a portal. We don't sell the database of employee or employer, like in traditional, uh, traditional uh, job portals or any mm -hmm. blue collar agencies, they sell the candidate or they sell the employer data to mm -hmm. the uh, vice versa, right? But in this case, we are purely transactional basis company. We, pay, we get paid from the employer only if the job is got done, mm -hmm. right? And it's a real time and no CVs to be sent, no interviews. All candidates are pre-screened. It's a, like a grab model for mm -hmm. the blue collars. Okay. So if, if I may ask, okay, are there any other smear businesses that uh, no. is in the same space as yours? No. No, not, not the, okay. this, the, the way we, we are doing, no. Okay. More so, on the job so, portal, yes. Like you post a job, people apply for it, then you, ma then you call them, schedule an interview. If for a four, four hours part-time job, which is getting paid for about $60, $70, they still have to go through 
three days of uh, telephonic interviews and all these things. But in our platform, it's all uh, eliminated and it reduced down to four hours or maybe less. Okay, I mean, for, for, for the specifics of that, um, I'll be interested to have a separate conversation with you. Sure, sure. Okay. It should be a separate, yeah. To, to, to hear a bit more, okay, so that I won't hold back the rest. Um, but but I, I hear a bit about your model, okay, but I, I would like to know uh, obviously a lot more because um, just in a few words, it's quite difficult for me to see your model, okay, how unique it is, okay. Um, so let, let, let me come back to you, okay, if you could, um, can you actually let Emily know so maybe we can connect somehow, okay, and then we can just have a brief conversation separately offline. Okay. Yeah, sure. A any um, body else who have questions? Okay, I I'm looking at the chat sessions. Um, okay, yes, there are some VCs here. However, the VCs in Singapore is not as dynamic, okay, as many VCs in other countries. Okay, Singapore, I think you have um people like Monks Hill, Monks Hill Ventures. Okay, um, you have uh, Sequoia Capital that's here. Okay, um, not very, very active, but they are here. Okay, and, and these VCs that you see here, okay, sorry, but they are not as humongous, okay, as many of the foreign VCs. Okay, but if you're just looking at a small Singaporean startup, sure, okay, there's VCs here. But the numbers are far lesser. There are a lot, a lot more VCs in Silicon Valley, uh, in China, uh, even in Indonesia, okay, as well as actually in Malaysia, surprisingly, right? Okay, so some of you may not have um, questions for me right now. Okay, um, and also I, I would pretty much expect that because it's a bit abstract for some of you. Okay, but if you do have any questions, feel free to connect with um, myself or with my colleague Emily, and then Emily will be able to um, post the questions and, and share with you a bit more. All right. Okay, with that, um, if you have no further questions, um, I will end my actually um, presentation. Okay, and our our for those uh, private messages that you have, okay, I will speak to you separately. Okay, and then we'll take it forward from there. All right, with that, um, thank you for joining me. Um, it's been really nice spending the last one hour with you uh, just during this circuit breaker. I hope to see many of you again in my next upcoming webinar, or if not in some of my training workshops, all right? Thank you very much, and I will speak to you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Stanley. Thank you, have Thanks. a good day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, thank, thank, you. thank, thank you. you. Thanks, I hope you find it interesting. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, we do. Thank you.